Hello. Are everybody here? Hello. So no. we'll have in this case. Hello. Are we are we actually ready to start? Right? Right. We're so ready. Basically, we have quite a, a tough schedule, which will in basically the whole session will take us two and a half hours. Uh, so it's kind of challenging. So I suggest that we start immediately, and then people who will be joining will also have the chance to uh, uh, to to join and, and to and to listen. Um, just one technical question: um, How can I basically? How can I transfer the the um, the right to share the screen? Do, does anybody know? I think you have a tab which is called safety or безопасность and where uh, there you can uh, allow other people to share the screen if you are the organizer. Okay, it's already it's already done. So basically I guess we all have the chance actually to share, right? Do, do you see this the, the the opportunity to do so? In this case, okay, let's Let's start. Otherwise, you will you, you will signal me, and I will try to do something about that. Okay? It actually says it's security rather than safety, anyway, and and it's already share screen actually allow participants to. So basically, we are all here in the in the equal in the equal conditions and opportunities. So let us start. And I'm very happy that this is the second time I have an honor, basically, to uh, moderate the. Uh, climate change session within the student guide art forum it's it's really an honor for me and then like thrilled to do this again we have quite a few uh, i would say very nice presentations to be done by uh, students and by experts and this time we decided that we will do like the mix so instead of making a particular session dedicated to experts and then a particular session dedicated to students i decided that this time we will mix it up so everybody have a chance to make presentation within the particular part of the session. So we'll have three parts. One is all about adverse impacts of climate change. Another one, climate change mitigation. And the last one, like joining forces, and we will be talking mostly about the participation of armed forces, basically, in tackling climate change uh, challenges. So let us start immediately, and I would uh, be very grateful and would be like an, an honor for me to uh, pass the floor to Miss Catherine Arnold, who is the uh, uh, the um, counselor in charge of uh, climate diplomacy, science, and economics from the British Embassy in Russia. So, Catherine, I'm really, really gr thrilled to see you again. Hello, and uh, please, please start. Hello, Michael, and thank you. Um, I'm very pleased also to open today's session of the third Student Guide Academic Conference, Climate Change, Learn and Do, which you're all at. And thank you very much to Mikhail Yulkin and uh, your colleagues for the invitation to speak at this important event. First of all, um, I would like to note with great sadness that I heard today that His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, passed away this morning. He was an environmentalist and a champion of both the natural world and the role and ambitions of young people to improve their society. It's therefore fitting that I'm speaking here today. Climate change is not a distant threat. The science clearly shows that we must act together to accelerate action to reduce emissions, protect our environment, and adapt to the consequences that we are already seeing all over the world. Devastating fires and floods, cyclones and hurricanes are increasingly the new normal and some of these impacts have also been felt here in Russia in recent years. Biodiversity is collapsing with one million species at risk of extinction and ecosystems are disappearing and deserts spreading. Every year we lose 10 million hectares of forests. Air and water pollution are killing 9 million people annually but emissions are 62% higher now than when international climate negotiations began in 1990. The threat of climate change is clear and its impacts are global. So the solutions to climate change must also be global. Today's event is an excellent example of the growing demand for international cooperation to tackle climate change. I had the pleasure of speaking at this event last year 
At about the time that lockdown in Moscow had begun, much has happened since. The world has been wrestling with the impacts of COVID-19, which has clearly been the global priority. But despite the pandemic, significant steps have been taken on climate in the last year too. Countries have been coming forward with ambitious climate denouncements, and there's a growing trend of net zero targets being included in these. For example, from China, Japan and the UK and others. As I'm sure you are aware, the COP26 climate conference is taking place in November this year in Glasgow. The UK, as COP26 president, is committed to working with all countries to raise ambition for climate action. We are working with governments and non-state actors to move to net zero and to drive global progress in five key areas. They are energy, nature, adaptation and resilience, clean transport and green finance. There is great opportunity for progress in all of these areas in Russia. Through our presidency, we are championing a clean, inclusive and resilient recovery from the impacts of COVID-19. As we continue to rebuild from the coronavirus pandemic, we have seen governments, business and civil society across the world uniting in their calls to place climate action at the forefront of economic recovery plans. UK is committed to an inclusive COP26, which involves all of society and, of course, young people are on the front line of global climate action. You are increasingly aware of the challenges and opportunities that the necessary transition to low carbon growth entails, and many of you are joining the global dialogue on solutions, getting involved and taking action. Today's event provides an ex excellent platform to exchange views, discuss with leading experts, scientists and representatives of universities some key challenges facing the humanity, such as sustainable green development and climate change. I'm delighted to see that so many of you have joined and are engaging with these issues. I encourage you all to take advantage of today's session, to learn from each other and the speakers, and I hope that you will take inspiration from today to drive forward action on climate change at home and around the world. Thank you very much again for inviting me to speak to you today, which I'm sure will be a fascinating event. Thank you very much, Katarina. It was really inspiring. So now we uh, have to switch to the um, presentations that are declared uh, in our, in our sub-sessions. And I would uh, start with the uh, sub-session which is called Adverse Impacts of Climate Change, What's at Stake? And definitely we need to know much better and uh, with the uh, uh, the best accuracy we can uh, calculate the losses, calculate the damages, calculate the threats and risks that the humanity will face uh, as the global change is progressing. Just in order to have better understanding what's at stake and what shall we can actually lose if we fail in this battle against climate change, um, which is the main challenge we're facing in the 21st century. Um, with these words, I would uh, definitely like to pass the floor to Yulia Kuznetsova, who is uh, a like, prominent scientist from the Moscow State University. And uh, she's done a lot, uh, basically, in terms of climate change and the human humanity, uh, humanitarian dimension of climate change. So this time, she agreed to speak a little bit about the climate change refugees. Do we have such? Are we going to have more of them? What are the numbers that are so far circulating among the uh, uh, scientific literature and in the mass media. So with these words, Yulia, I would like you to step up. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to me also to speak uh, here, speak with the students, uh, speak with uh, colleagues. Uh, and um, Gail asked me to, to give an overview uh, about climate migrations and climate refugees. And now I'll share the screen and uh, show you some slides I've prepared for this talk. Uh, I have a title, it might seem a little bit strange, but there is actually a question uh, that is uh, in discussions over the world. Uh, who are climate refugees? Is it a necessary complication to, to speak this way? or it is a reality, a dangerous reality and a dangerous future that is upcoming. So first of all, um, the first question I would, would like to talk about is uh, do climate refugees exist at all? And then there is a spoiler, they don't officially. But there is a story to tell. 
So uh, maybe the, the most important basic thing to understand for everyone, maybe some people know about it, but I think it is important to say about this, uh, the, the main things uh, at the beginning. Uh, who is a refugee officially? Uh, there was a famous uh, international refugee convention in 1951. After all the world wars, it was very important to protect uh, freedom, of, to protect lives of people. So uh, there was this convention and then there was the following protocol in 1967. And everyone can download it. It's uh, open, of course. Uh, you can read the definitions. And then there are the definitions at this slide too. Uh, this slide too. But uh, in general, refugee is someone who cannot live in his home country, his homeland or her homeland and can cannot move back if he moved uh, at the beginning because there is a danger to his or her life and a danger to, uh, of freedom and this is now the basic one of the most basic rules of international law so there should be a danger to life uh, and when we speak of climate change when we speak of all these modern challenges and the uh, risks uh, we we are facing now uh, it is not necessary that everywhere on earth where we can observe uh, the consequences of climate change, uh, it is not necessary that there is a danger uh, to people's lives. But uh, there is a story that uh, officially finished uh, last year, one year ago, exactly. Uh, there is one person called uh, Ioana Tetiota. He is a citizen of Kiribati. This is a country in the Pacific Ocean, and he lived at uh, Tarawa Atoll, which is on the slide here. This is a small island, uh, and it's about uh, three meters only. The highest point is three meters above sea level. Obviously, when we speak of climate change, we well, one of the first consequences is sea level rise. And uh, of course, uh, he, he and his family and all other people in this country, uh, same in the other Icelandic countries in, in the oceans, are in danger. Uh, I guess uh, it is not, um, it, it is true to say that all these people live in low coastal areas and they are all in danger of sea level rise and also not uh, just the flood that may cover their lands, but also uh, they are in danger of storms and surges and other um, uh, dangerous natural hazards and processes. So this person uh, applied officially uh, for the status of a climate refugee. Uh, he was the first officially in the world. But uh, the Supreme Court of New Zealand, where he moved with his family, uh, denied his application uh, so he had to go back and the reason was that the uh, in his homeland he didn't have uh, the actual danger to his life right now uh, same for his family then he applied for the same status uh, at the UN at the United Nations and in 2020 he, uh, his application was cancelled as well but there was an official uh, statement um, made by the uh, United Nations Commission on Human Rights, where actually you can see the, uh, the text here. Uh, actually, the UN um, officially uh, said that there is a problem we should face now and we will face more in the future. That climate change may lead to violation of human rights in the future, and we should all take into account these problems, and we sh should all deal with uh, official terms and with official measures and with international law as well. Uh, there are some other possibilities to call these people because officially they still do not exist in in uh, in this international law. Uh, there is an, uh, uh, an international organization of migrations, EOM, uh, and they use usually a uh, term environmental migrants, uh, which are who are the persons or group of persons who move due to any environmental reason. This is quite a common and wide term because uh, it may include not only climate climate and climate change migrants, but also any ecological migrants, any um, 
um, let's say geologic hazards that are the reasons of migrations and everything else. And there are also two other problems that we should deal with using this term or any other term. Uh, first of all, uh, climate is never the only reason of migration and one of the most uh, most uh, great I don't know, uh, examples of this is Syrian conflict. I will talk about this a bit later, but it is now proved by scientists, uh, there are a lot of papers about it and even books already, that climate was one of the reasons uh, of Syrian conflict and some other arm, armed conflicts in the world. Uh, but we cannot call these people who had to leave the country only climatic refugees or climatic uh, climate migrants because there are um, there was a number of reasons. And then there is another problem by uh, of choosing different terms is that climate and other environmental reasons were always uh, the, the reason to move. Here is the photograph in Wikipedia uh, of refugees that, who had to, to leave their homeland because of the drought, extreme drought in the US. So there were cases in, in, in the past and there is a complex, always complexity of reasons now and in the past too, and will be a complex uh, of reasons in the future. And it's uh, now a challenge, what term we use. And it's not just about playing the words, but it's about official measures we take, official solutions we choose. Uh, so it is important to call these people properly. We don't have this name for now. Uh, why then do we speak of climate migrants now more than in the past if we say that there were cases in the past? Here is the graph of uh, different uh, natural hazards happening in, in the world uh, over almost 40 years. And you may see that a number of hazards uh, related to hydrological, meteorological, climatological factors this number is increasing extremely. Uh, this red line, red and orange line in the bottom is uh, for geophysical hazards like earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and um, tsunamis. And the number of such events is more or less similar over the years when we take a long period. But all things, all hazards, all uh, dangerous processes related to climate their number is, is rising extremely. That's why the risks of migrations is rising too. And it's not just local things, local cases like in the US, um, in Oklahoma, at the slide, uh, the previous slide, but also over the world. And in different locations, the cases may be, may be different. Uh, speaking of a number of people moving, uh, here is the graph uh, from Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, and you may see the numbers of people no, moving up to now, actually, from 15 to 20, 25, sometimes 40 million people move internally every year due to weather related hazards, such as uh, floods, uh, cyclones, uh, droughts and other things. Only yellow, uh, yellow color at the bottom is geophysical hazards uh, like earthquakes and tsunamis and volcanoes. And you may see just some years where this number is high. For example, in 2008, there was this uh, famous uh, and, and very hard uh, Sichuan uh, earthquake where many people died and many had to move. But this is like unique years. And in general, uh, a number of weather related Migrate migrations is very high. Uh, and uh, if speaking of, of forecasts, you may see these numbers in the literature. Usually it's 200 million by 2050. And this, uh, this data, this number is uh, printed everywhere in mass media and also in scientific papers and official reports by international organizations and so on. Uh, there can be some differences. Speaking of different regions uh, of the world, there can be different numbers, but in general, it's tens and hundreds of millions of people. Uh, and uh, the global values may uh, vary from 25 million to 1 billion people, but in general, it's 200 million in only uh, 30 years globally. Um, 
what are the most risky areas and why do people move? This is the map, um, which also uh, which is also used in in many uh, official reports and also in mass media too. Uh, and you may see main areas which are at main risk now in the world. Uh, in general, there can be four uh, areas, four types of areas uh, taken into account as most risky. First, well, generally, uh, you may see three types of areas in official reports, but I added the fourth one. So the, the three main ones are coastal areas, uh, then mountain areas, high mountain areas, and drylands. But I think it is important to speak about the Arctic areas, though there are not many people living there, considering, uh, comparing with, uh, for example, uh, drylands, but still it's a huge, uh, huge area and it's under risk. So uh, a little bit into details of these types of the areas. Uh, when, when we uh, take into account low coastal areas, um, first of all, it's a risk of sea level rise. Uh, there is a IPCC forecast. I, I, I guess you all know what is IPCC, International Commission, uh, speaking of climate change, putting all the data together. And then there is IPCC official forecast, and it's uh, it says uh, 0 0.3 to 1 to 0 0.1 meter of sea level rise by the end of the century. It's quite a lot, especially uh, when we know that over 200 million people live at the low elevated area along the coast. Uh, low elevated here is uh, below five meters above sea level. So all these people are under risk of floods actually, uh, or even uh, under risk that their homelands will be fl flooded forever. Uh, and also, um, it is important that uh, by 2100, by this year, it's not only the forecast of sea level rise, but th there is also a forecast of population rise. And uh, the UN forecast says that the population will double by the end of the century. So there are more people now, will be at risk now uh, than at, uh, by the end of the century than now. Um, here is just the picture how it will be uh, that the floodplain of the sea uh, and in the plain where with the risk of uh, storms and surges and all the other dangerous processes at the coast, uh, the, the area of this floodplain is bigger and bigger. Uh, but also, uh, and there, there are already examples in the world uh, where people have already moved. For example, there are a few villages in Alaska at the low, uh, very low barrier islands or bars along the coast. Uh, the, 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 there are some people who already moved. Uh, also, uh, many countries uh, at the islands, at the Pacific Ocean, at the Indian Ocean, uh, many countries already started fundraising uh, for moving their citizens including uh, Kiribati, uh, if you remember the story of Ioana Di Piotta, I started with. Uh, but also there is uh, another risk of uh, greater, greater salinity of the coastal areas. Not just the floods, but this salty water getting into the land uh, may turn this land into uh, not... Uh, not good for agriculture. Like, for example, in Vietnam, in the Mekong Delta, which is very low uh, above the sea level, but it's a uh, historically very important place for, uh, for agriculture. It, it actually feeds millions and millions of people in Southeast Asia. And now there is a rise of salinity. So quite soon, many parts of this delta will not be used for agriculture any longer. Then uh, a few words about the mountains, uh, why they are important. Uh, there are two, um, I'm sorry for interrupting the talk, but you can hear always someone typing and... and um, okay, no, I, I don't think these people... Have can, can hear me. Uh, well, um, in mountain areas, there are uh, the main risks are related to glaciers melting and shortening of snow periods. 
there is less snow usually but the most important and the period that the period of snow cover is shorter uh, that's why we actually lose one of the main sources of fresh water over the globe uh, according to um, UN and the other international organizations uh, following the, the global freshwater resources, up to 80% of our freshwater resources come from mountain systems and in particular from the glaciers. Lose the glaciers, we lose the freshwater. Uh, then uh, there is also a forecast that up to 700 million people will be water crisis. Okay, vale, Mikhail, can we do something with that? Because I can hear yes. huh? I don't know what I can do. You can do anything about that. Hey, guys, Victor Escobar, please switch off your mute your mic. Maybe you can uh, maybe you can mute it as the owner of the um, of the conference. Okay. Because I can hear a person even uh, louder than me. <laughs> All right. No, yes, sir. Here. Yes. Uh, so there is a forecast that up to 700 million people will be at risk of water crisis in the mountains and, and, and the areas around due to glaciers melting. Uh, for example, uh, this includes the areas in Central Asia, like Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and the other uh, countries which will be already are and will be even more important sources of migrants from Asia to Russia, for example. Uh, now in Tajikistan, every fourth of uh, male population uh, have already moved due to uh, problems of, of uh, having a traditional, uh, tr traditional life there in working in agriculture in Tajikistan. And there is also a risk of uh, natural hazards in the mountains like uh, debris flows and landslides and so on. Um, of course, it is important to speak about the Arctic areas uh, in terms of migrations uh, and uh, 25, one fourth of northern hemisphere is occupied by permafrost and a lot more than uh, half of Russian territory is occupied by per permafrost. And permafrost is melting now. Uh, there is a forecast by IPCC again that one third of permafrost area may shrink by uh, 2050 and the seasonal uh, thawing layer will be deeper and deeper from year to year. This means that uh, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of construction works that had uh, had been done here uh, will just uh, collapse or need a special uh, special uh, treating in in uh, in the upcoming years. There are only compared to, for example, Asia, four million people live in Arctic uh, area, but it's an area of a lot of resources. It's an area where we have a lot of traditional uh, um, traditional tribes and people, it, it, both in in uh, Eurasia in. Europe and Russia and in North America. So it is very important to not forget this area. And also uh, there is a, a story of drylands, of course. Uh, it's not only tropical areas, but mainly tropical areas. Uh, in general, uh, drylands occupy almost half of the total land area on the earth, on the planet. And there are 3 billion people living in these drylands, almost half of, of the world population. Uh, and then there are a lot of uh, risks in these areas uh, that are upcoming or already uh, risks that we are facing there. First of all, it's a heat, extreme heat, uh, heat waves. Uh, the, there are different forecasts for <clears throat> predictions for temperature rise in the future. But uh, by the end of the century, it may rise from 1.8 to 4 uh, degrees Celsius and then uh, it is very important that people live in uh, not uh, not not nice areas because we we, we can hardly uh, bear this this very high extreme temperatures. But the main thing here is the risk of droughts and the risk of losing water resources. Um, uh, then there is a forecast that uh, by the end of the century, uh, at least 
one billion people will be at risk of droughts, land degradation and water scarcity in dry lakes. So it's it, it's really a lot and it's a huge problem in these areas. Uh, one of the most, uh, I promised to tell a little bit about Syrian conflict. So one of the most uh, hardest examples, hardest cases in the world uh, is Syrian conflict. I, I mean, uh, during the last uh, decade, let's say. Syrian conflict because it, this is uh, a, an example of complexity of problems, but one of these problems here is climate change. The story started in uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, where uh, a lot of cities in, in Syria and the whole country had a very uh, low precipitation. This is uh, there are two pictures uh, at the slide uh, showing uh, the, the lack of anomalies of uh, rainfalls. Um, extreme drought during uh, at least three years uh, before 2011. And then uh, we actually had agricultural collapse in the country because land it could not be used for agriculture without water. Uh, a lot of people moved to cities looking for food, looking for water and everything. And then there was a water crisis because of overpopulation and everything. And then there were protests, uh, including armed protests, and the whole story of Syrian conflict started. Uh, by now, we have nearly 5 million refugees who lived the, this uh, homeland and almost 7, 7 million of internal migrants in this country. Here is the question. How do we consider these people, who they are? Uh, are they uh, climate refugees? Are they climate migrants? Or are they just uh, unlucky people who lived in such unlucky uh, situation? And what is the actual role of climate here? Do we take it uh, as the first and basic reason of, of all this, the whole story? Or do we take consider it as one of the reasons? Uh, there is a book uh, published in 2020, a very new one, um, called The Origins of Syrian Conflict. And then there is a, quite an interesting framework uh, suggested by the author. And here you can see this framework. It's called Human Environmental Climate Security. And uh, actually, this is the way to take into account all the problems that may happen in one area and may lead to uh, conflicts, to uh, extreme problems in the area. Uh, it is important to uh, make a system of the problems, to, to see this complexity, to put climate together with economic and political situation, with all the other factors here. And then we maybe can find the solutions in every local uh, case. Uh, in general, coming back to the first question I, uh, I asked at the first, at the title slide, uh, who are climate refugees? Is it a necessary complication of the story uh, of, of complex, complex, uh, complexity of reasons, or is it a dangerous reality? I would say that this is a re reality, and this is even more dangerous future that is coming. But it's very important to understand the role of climate here. And it doesn't matter which term we finally choose to call these people. It is important that we use all the same terms and we take uh, take it seriously and, and, um, and use it in international law worldwide. I think the main difference of what we have now, what we, of what we face now, uh, and uh, some cases of climate migrants in the past is that now it's global, but we still have to work locally to consider every story as a unique story and to consider uh, unique measures to solve it. Well, this is it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I would be happy to answer some questions if yeah, someone if, if you can stay at least at, um, at the end of this sub session, then it will be great and we'll put all the questions together. If there are any. I really would like to thank you very much, Julie, for this very, I would say, overwhelming presentation. It was not only about the climate change refugees, but actually about all the threats and risks that humanity can face, starting from the sea level rise, floods, droughts, agricultural issues, fresh water, whatever. So basically, and, and, and the cherry of the top,
basically is the people who have to leave because the uh, conditions in their homeland um, become unlivable. So this is a really nice story. Thank you very much. It does answer the question, what is at stake? And now I would like to pass the floor to um, Marina Antipova, who would like to a little bit, uh, like another angle of the question and uh, uh, particularly a bit about the biodiversity loss as, as a result of the climate change. Marina, are you there? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, hello, and I'm here today with my colleague Elizabeth Rehovtseva. Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, so let me start by welcoming you all. And today we're going to tell you about biodiversity loss as 50% of the world's biodiversity dies. Biodiversity represents the wealth of biological resources available to us. It's all about sustaining the natural area made up of a community of plants, animals, and other living things that has been reduced at a steady rate as we plan human activities. Biodiversity is our common heritage and humanity's most important life support and safety net. But our safety net is almost stretched to a breaking point. And today we'll look at direct drivers of change in nature, key indirect drivers of damage to biodiversity, actions for sustainability, and then we'll provide you with recommendations for communities to prevent the problem from becoming unsolvable. The health of ecosystems on which we and all other species depend is deteriorating more rapidly than ever. Around 1 million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction, many within decades, more than ever before in human history. The average abundance of native species in most major land-based habitats has fallen by at least 20%. The continuing decline in biodiversity has had negative consequences for the delivery of many ecosystem services over the last decades. These include habitat maintenance, pollination, regulation of freshwater quantity and quality, soil formation, and regulation of floods. The declines have occurred in part because of the intensive agriculture and forestry practices. The biodiversity of Europe and Central Asia is in continuous strong decline. Of the assessed species living exclusively in Europe and Central Asia, 28% are threatened. The five direct drivers of change in nature with the largest relative global impact so far are changes in land and sea use, direct exploitation of organisms, climate change, pollution, and invasive alien species. Land use change is the major direct driver of the lo loss of both biodiversity and ecosystem services in Europe and Central Asia. Production-based subsidies have led to intensification in agriculture and forestry, and together with urban development have led to biodiversity decline. Although protected areas have expanded in the region, protected areas alone cannot prevent biodiversity loss. Only where protected areas are managed efficiently can they contribute to prevention of biodiversity loss. The impact of climate change and biodiversity and nature's contributions to people is increasing rapidly and is likely to be one of the most important drivers in the future. Current negative trends in biodiversity and ecosystems will undermine progress towards 80% of the SS targets for the Sustainable Development Goals. Loss of biodiversity is therefore shown to be not only an environmental issue, but also economic, social, and moral issue as well. Key indirect drivers include increased population and per capita consumption. Technological innovation, which has lowered and sometimes increased the damage to nature and issues of governance and accountability. Actions for sustainability are adopting cross-sectoral approaches that take into account the trade-offs of food and energy production, freshwater management, and biodiversity conservation, better integration across sectors to co coordinate biodiversity governance, and the sustainable delivery of nature's contributions to people would avoid negative outcomes for nature and people. Also identified as a key element of most sustainable future policies is the evolution of global financial system to build a global sustainable economy. Mainstreaming the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity and the sustained provision of nature's contributions to people into all sectoral policies and plans could be achieved with more, more proactive and goal-oriented approaches to environmental action, 
policy actions and societal initiatives are helping to raise awareness about the impact of consumption on nature and protecting local environments. Long-term societal transformation through continuous education and knowledge sharing is the most effective pathway for moving towards a sustainable future. It's undeniable that ecosystems are shrinking and vanishing. In conclusion, uh, through transformative change, nature can still be conserved, restored, and used sustainably. This is also key to meeting most other global goals. By transformative change, we mean a fundamental system-wide reorganization across technological, economic, and social factors. That is all we wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, you have your microphone turned off. Thank you very much. Thank you, sorry. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marina and, and uh, Lisa. It was really nice and like a very, I would say, broad picture of what is going on in terms of uh, biodiversity. And then it's a, a good like addition to what we've got, already heard from the start about the threats for, for humanity. It's like another angle and all together we can see basically that whole a living planet basically is under another under threat, which is called climate change. Uh, now we have like five minutes for questions and answers. Anybody in the audience would like to raise questions? Please, you can do it. No? No. You're serious. Okay. Okay. In this case, may I uh, probably uh, ask a question as a moderator? I don't think it's good to, to leave without questioning the, the um, speakers. So my question would be first um, to, to Julia. Um, uh, are there any kind of um, scientific research which uh, basically can an answer the question to what extent the climate change mitigation can be valuable in terms of preventing the uh, climate migration? Uh, I would say that there is a, a basic problem between uh, now environmental natural sciences, social sciences, uh, governments would take uh, and, and choose solutions and all these things. And all papers that might, I hope they will come soon, uh, but all papers uh, to, 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 to have these studies, we have to have the dialogue between all these people. And there is now, uh, uh, this dialogue now is not good enough, I think, because uh, either social scientists work with their things or natural scientists work with their things. That's why we don't even have a term for these people who move due to climate change now. Uh, so I do think that there can be uh, some solutions enough to, for adaptation in, in, but in some areas, but in some areas, for example, uh, that are under risk of, of uh, sea level rise, you cannot do anything, of course, uh, except stopping climate change in general, but it's impossible for now. Uh, the, so the solutions uh, may happen, but we do need to study more. We do need to find this uh, dialogue. Normally, this is what's happening when we have like interdisciplinary question, right? So we need to yeah. combine. It sometimes it doesn't work very well because there's no habit to do so, right? Yes. Like divide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come together, start discussing things. One more question to you. Is it reasonable to say that in case of three degrees centigrade warming, three billion people would face a great lack of drinking water and have to migrate or might have to migrate? Uh, once again, I didn't hear the, the numbers exactly. In, uh, is, it, is it reasonable to say that if the global warming would raise up to three degrees centigrade, then three billion people over the globe would be at risk of, you know, lacking drinking water and would be forced or might be forced to migrate? Uh, did you just double the numbers I've showed, right? Uh, th there was a number that uh, if we have a, a, a temperature rise up to 1.5 degree, then we have 1 billion people at risk of, uh, of uh, 
water crisis, right? And you tried to double it, actually. Uh, I don't know. Yes. We should we should check it because uh, the density of population is very different in different regions, and uh, every number has to be counted uh, separately uh, because every like. Uh, 0 0.1 degree centigrade is very important, but it may it may have different consequences in different regions. It is if if we right. have a temperature rise up to three degrees, of course it's more than a billion people. But exact number I would not say just like this. We we have to check it. All right. Thank you very much. Now the questions for uh, Marina and Lisa. Um, the question would be. Do we still think that um, that uh, humanity is still able to stop biodiversity losses by whatever climate change mitigation measures or whatever? Do you think there is still an opportunity available, or this is something that is like, you know, un unchangeable? Uh, well, is, or can we still avoid this? I think we can still avoid this uh, because as we've said in our presentation, if we take uh, initiatives and actions to protect biodiversity, we may overcome this huge biodiversity loss. And even though we cannot save all the animals and species, we may still be able to protect uh, the most part of the species through our actions and through raising awareness of this problem. Uh, yes, and my, in my opinion, we might not be able to save the whole world, but we can help improve our local areas um, and take our time to clean up animal habitats so like beaches, forests and other undeveloped areas. And as a result, we can make our areas, uh, local areas, Welcome, more welcoming for wildlife, for instance. Okay, thank you very much. I guess it's enough for the first subsession and we have to move fast, otherwise we're at risk of wasting time. Um, now, uh, I would, I would uh, start with saying that uh, the, the, the whole problem we face now, uh, we have to kind of adapt to the climate changes which are kind of unavoidable. And if the temperature even rise like 1.5 degrees centigrade, then we still have something uh, in, in the climate new that we need to adapt to. But anyway, in order even to, um, to limit the climate change to 1.5 degree or well, at the well below the two degrees, which is set in the uh, Paris Agreement, we need to act, right? We need to do something. We need to mitigate climate change by introducing measures that will aim to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So we were discussing this uh, second subsession, what it takes basically to mitigate climate change and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that we are producing rapidly so far. And that would probably start with uh, uh, inviting George Sofonov, uh, the scientist from the uh, High School of Economics, to uh, introduce this topic by you know, a little bit about the green innovation and sustainable growth, about the challenges and opportunities we're, we're having in this, in this area. So, George, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me open my presentation. Okay. Uh -huh. Oops. Okay, let me show full screen. It's on below, I guess. Oops. Yeah, hope it's okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, what I wanted to tell you today is a bit broader than just focusing on climate change issues and challenges of uh, mitigation and ad adaptation. Uh, what I wanted to talk about is to broaden our agenda for discussion and include uh, some additional things into discussion of how the world, how uh, national economies, or regional economies may develop uh, in uh, direction of green growth. And what is the role of green innovations in this green growth? Uh, so two major questions that I would like to address is, first of all, how to measure green, green growth and to understand where are we now? Are we okay with greening economy or we are still far from it? 
how to measure it, what are the indicators, who can do this, uh, are we really doing this in our uh, usual practice of uh, calculating our progress in economic development. And second big thing, challenge for me is whether green innovations really help to green economies, to green the economic growth, or there, there, there are other ideas around that. So these issues relate to climate, uh, climate change um, problems, but not only, because it's a, a broader concept and broader vision that should be incorporated in our decision-making. Uh, first of all, let me say a couple of words about uh, terminology. So OECD considers green growth as um, fostering economic growth and development while ensuring that natural assets continue to provide the resources and environmental services on which our well-being relies. This is very important understanding. Uh, so we should keep natural assets. So a focus on natural assets as providing services and resources for us, for society, for economy, to uh, continue being prosperous or increase the well-being of uh, human beings. Uh, World Resources Institute considers green growth in terms of three dimensions. So not only focusing on environmental assets, natural assets, but also considering economic, environmental, and social uh, indicators of well-being altogether. So not only economics is important, not only environment is important, but people are important. Social aspects of development are crucial. So it, it is closer to sustainability concept and it is important to incorporate it in our understanding where we are and how we measure growth. How really to measure green growth? Uh, traditional indicators, for instance, uh, gross uh, domestic product or uh, per capita income or many other indicators that we usually uh, calculate are not really relevant for assessment of green growth. And sustainability. So you cannot use GDP uh, uh, apparently for measuring green growth or non-green growth. Why? Just because it, these indicators don't account for environmental degradation and health impacts of pollution, or exhaustion of natural resources, climate change, and many, many other aspects of development. We heard about biodiversity losses, they are not included in GDP. Or extraction of resources, oil, gas, or destruction of forest uh, ecosystems. That's not reflected in GDP in negative terms, but more often in positive terms. So we destroy everything and our GDP is growing. It's, it's not really um, reasonable to do so. So we need some different measurements. Green accounting is needed for appropriate measuring of green growth. Uh, I should refer to OECD a system of indicators, which is very complex and include natural resources, environmental quality, health impacts, subsidies to fossil fuels, innovations, investments, and many, many other aspects of uh, growth and development. This uh, chart shows what specific uh, areas are covered by the system of uh, indicators that OECD has developed. And what is very good is that many countries report according to this um, measurement framework. So we know how these countries develop, but these are mostly OECD countries. So we don't know about uh, much, don't know much about uh, the rest of the world. So probably it's worth to consider this system of indicators for further expansion to other countries. What ex uh, conclusions were made uh, in a recent report of OECD in 2017. Uh, conclusions often relating to the year 2000. So the world is very slow in greening growth. So we are not fast. We have some champions, uh, countries champions, but overall we are very slow with it. We are moving towards it, but not really effectively. Uh, income inequality has increased uh, in about half of OECD and G20 countries, income inequality relates to social dimension of growth. Uh, global CO2 emissions continue to grow up 
58 percent from 1990. You remember in 1992 the world presented and signed uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So we started dealing with climate problem uh, almost uh, 30 years ago, and since then our emissions uh, increased by almost 60 percent, not decreased. Uh, productivity remain low in many major energy consuming countries, which is very bad because we hope that they're doing something, they're rich, they should do something and can. No, that's not so. It's, it's still low in many of those countries. Many forests are threatened to, by degradation and many ecosystems have been degraded or already. So this is also a bad indication. And related to hu human uh, Anthropos uh, anthropocentric vision of development, uh, human health and human life. We should see that air pollution by the most dangerous particular matters, so small, um, uh, small matters uh, below 2.5 uh, micro, uh, micro uh, meters, uh, which are affecting health of uh, people very strongly, Relay, remains high in many countries. I should see, show you this uh, map. This is terrible map of uh, countries where uh, uh, share of population exposed to pollution levels above the levels recommended by World Health Organization in, uh, in the situation for 2016. So you may see that huge territories are in very red, uh, dark red uh, side of that terrible uh, vision. And we can see what's in Russia. 86% uh, of population is exposed to pollution levels above WHO guidelines. And if 10 uh, uh, nanograms per cubic meter is the reference level of WHO, in Russia it is 15. So what does this mean in terms of economics? And as economists, I should not note this specifically. So GDP losses from pollution in Russia are measured by different scientific groups. And World Bank study recently, not very recently, but still a few years ago, published a report showing that uh, pollution causes uh, uh, total welfare losses uh, approximately $280 billion measured in uh, purchasing um, uh, power parity, approximately uh, 8.3% of GDP in 2013. This is huge loss. Imagine that Russia wanted to grow like 5 or 7% um, per year. If we account for these losses, we will see that we are growing, so to say, in negative sense. So uh, GDP growth is negative, but not uh, positive. Uh, there are different uh, systems of indicators how to measure if growth is green or not. For instance, this Global Green Economy Index, uh, which uh, includes uh, 32 indicators covering leadership and climate change, efficiency by sectors, markets, investments, environmental quality. If we look at that, we see some champions so like Sweden and Switzerland, Iceland are in top of that rating by this index, and Russia is. Uh, very low, 105th. Uh, environmental Performance Index, which was developed by Yale University and Columbia University in partnership with World Economic Forum, they also have some measurement, uh, including 24 indicators by two categories, environmental health and ecosystem vitality, which are both extremely important. If you look at those um, recent estimates by countries, we will also see some champions in this index, like Denmark, Luxembourg, and uh, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom is fourth, and Russia is 58th. So we are really low, and probably it's reasonable because we don't include these green indicators in our measurements. Uh, is green innovation important for green growth or not? Uh, I should say that uh, innovator is extremely important uh, figure, person, in the whole process of innovations. Uh, this person is able to jump to new solutions based on knowledge, way of life, research, always looking for something new, 
trying to improve something always. I have met many innovators like that. Um, they are actually very fragile persons. They need support and need attention. Most often they're unable to make business. They can in invent, but they cannot do business, though there are some examples, of course. Um, there are two types of innovations, actually. So borrowing of more effective and modern technologies from other countries and companies is most popular way of innovating. So you don't invent anything yourself. You just take something and adjust to your circumstances. Well, second way of, second type of innovation is development of your own technologies, commercialization of that technologies, promotion to markets, fighting with others in the market to, to, to win with your innovation. Uh, modern innovation, innovators need ecosystems for innovations, which include usually universities, business schools, technoparks, grants, business angels and funds, business incubators and accelerators, crowdfunding platform, professional communities. We know a few successful examples like MIT in the eastern coast of the US and Silicon Valley in the western coasts of the US. But we also can find some similar pieces of ecosystem for innovators in Russia. For instance, in, in High School of Economics, we have business incubator, and uh, we basically see how uh, Skolkova uh, Fund supports uh, innovations. So there are other institutes of uh, supporting innovators and uh, uh, inventions in Russia. Um, what we may say about today's innovations, most innovations originate from highly science intensive works today. That's not cheap and easy innovations to do. They're quite rare now, mostly in, uh, in uh, information and communication technologies sector. Uh, invention is just the first, but tiny part of the whole process where we see that R&D and production and commercialization plays a huge important role. And for that, you need capital, you need expertise, you need resources uh, to be successful in that field of uh, real innovations today. Uh, most of modern innovations produced by large corporations during many years. So they, int they introduced these innovations gradually, step by step, uh, maximizing the revenue, expanding their products in the markets and capitalization growth is very important for them. So this is the profile of uh, uh, innovators, green innovators today. I cannot say uh, within that very short time limit about many aspects of the processes. I would refer you to the recent study that we published um, uh, and there is a link to it of green growth and innovation in the region of Central and Eastern Europe, Caucasus and Central Asia. That covers many aspects of that uh, innovation, green innovation process and green growth. And uh, specifically, I made a few case studies there. One about Slovakia, which is actually among top EU countries by firm certified by international standard ISO 14000, which is uh, environmental management standard. Slovenia is uh, sixth by Eco Innovation Index in the EU. 17. And um, Kazakhstan, a leader in green economy development in Central Asia, which was very interesting for me as a sort of partly successful case. And Georgia uh, was also interesting case because of failures, declarations, failures uh, of green uh, programs, but new uh, phase of development uh, is referred to uh, association with the EU and new environmental policies. Uh, finishing my uh, presentation, I should say that at High School of Economics, we have uh, for a few years already uh, the course, open course for everybody, Economics of Green Innovations from Theory to Practice, which is very successful among students. And the online course, this course will be coming in August 2021. Thank you for attention uh, and would be happy to answer your questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. George, if, if you can stay for a while, so we can actually put all together presentations and then switch to answers, questions and answers, that would be great. In the meantime, 
I, I would like then to uh, give the floor to two ladies, Andrzej Murtadion and Maria Sadinova, to talk a little bit about the impact of pandemic on the very famous and iconic, I would say, EU Green Deal. What is happening in, in that location? How they are developing? How they are progressing with their very ambitious Green Deal? Whether the pandemic impact in any way or are they still okay? So the ladies, the floor is yours. Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, just a second. Um, sorry. No, it's not the presentation. Um, okay, today we're going to tell you about the effect that the pandemic has had on the Green Deal. Um, Can you make it full screen? And the Green Deal is, oh, sorry, 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 I have some troubles. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, the Green Deal is a response to the existential threat of climate change and environmental degradation. Basically, uh, the green, it, it is the European Commission's plan to zero out its contribution to climate change and transform Europe's economy. The core aim of the proposal is to make European Union's countries climate neutral by 2050, which means that emissions will yield no net impact on the climate. Uh, yes, the immediacy of the coronavirus pandemic means that in the short term, the eyes of the media, governments and the public are turned on COVID-19, not climate change. As a result, this may pose a threat in the longer term to the European, to the European Green Deal. Okay, Gre despite these challenges, the current crisis also presents an opportunity for the EU. The pandemic and resulting economic recession provide the chance for the EU to rethink how its economy should function and its priorities after crisis is over. So you can see the budget, the EU's 2021-2027 long-term budget together with the temporary recovery in instrument, next generation EU, which amounts to 1.8 trillion euro. So it will be the main instrument for implementing the recovery package to tackle the social economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. It will also help transform the EU through its major policies, particularly the European Green Deal. For example, 30% of the EU budget will be spent to fight climate change. The package also pays specific attention to biodiversity protection. In 20, what is more, in 2026 and 2027, 10% of the annual spending under the long-term budget will contribute to halting and reversing the decline of biodiversity. Uh, yes, and uh, moreover, in September, the European Commission decided to tighten the EU 2030 target to a 50 or 55 percent cuts in greenhouse gas emissions from 90 90 levels from the previous 40 percent. Already, a Green Recovery Alliance has been launched in the European par Parliament. The agreement was signed by 70 national environment ministers from EU member states, calling for the European Green Deal to be put at the center of the the post-COVID-19 recovery. A great example of how recovery measures can help advance social issues is a ban proposed in several countries on government subsidies to companies whose, whose activities are connected with fossil fuels and livestock farming. Over $66 billion was invested in low-carbon energy, mainly due to Spanish and German subsidies for renewable energy projects and hydrogen and infrastructure investments. Additionally, um, over $86 uh, billion was announced for green transport, including electric vehicle transfers, subsidies, and investments in public transport. At the same time, near $35 billion was announced to modify buildings to increase energy efficiency, notably in France and at the United Kingdom. The European Commission is attempting to use uh, uh, near the $8,000 billion package to unlock 
a path toward green transition for many countries currently lagging. Accordingly, member states have to finalize plans to allocate at least 37% of funding to green measures approved by the Commission until April. All in all, the post-corona recovery can put the EU decarbonization progress back on track and even speed it up. The public will be more supportive of green policies due to COVID-19 as the pandemic has powerfully demonstrated that the issues that appear remote can quickly escalate and have wide-reaching effects. It has become clear how quickly a natural disaster can bring our economies to collapse. Anyway, there should be no trade-off between choosing a sustainable recovery and economic progress, because green technology have matured and now cheaper than fuel-based energy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right in time. Great. Uh, thank you. It was really, really nice. So basically, you, 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 you like saying that despite this, like, what countries are living through, and despite the pandemics that we're having to somehow survive, uh, uh, still there are opportunities to do nice things in terms of, you know, fostering green development and in terms of speeding up the low carbon transformation of the economy using the very fact that emissions already uh, went down because of the lockdown thing, right? And this is kind of a kind of a smart way of, I would say, of tackling the crisis, seeing first the opportunities associated with them rather than the, uh, the uh, you know, the risks and threats. Now we're moving forward and the next presentation would be done by Irina Romanova. A little bit in terms of risks associated with uh, uh, the renewable energy transition. Uh, so. Um, yes, good evening to everyone. Yes, please. Good. Yes, could you hear me? I will just demonstrate. So, yes, that's all right. So I'm pleased to, to present you my investigation and I will um, just um, say that our society actually faces some numerous challenges related to the unsustainable use and distribution of energy resources. And so you can uh, see the key goal and smaller tasks of our investigation on this slide. There is uh, an increasing trend um, away from fossil fuels and uh, this trend is known as the fourth energy transition. So, so that we call uh, transitioning to renewable energy sources. And it's determined by climate agenda and also by economic interests. On this slide, uh, you can observe the potential of the renewable energy sources in the global energy mix. There is a rise in renewable investments and also in renewable energy demand. So uh, risk identification is a crucial part of the strategic decision-making process of the oil and gas companies. The renewable energy sources risks should be divided into the following categories, political, economic, social, technological, environmental, and legal. So comparing political risks, the greatest weight is assigned to international conflicts as an external threat to political terrorism, which is becoming relevant due to automated data collection and also to excessive taxation, which certainly will vary from country to country. It must be also emphasized that the economic risks are highly rated, and this is due to the fact that at the stage of renewable energy formation, energy demand and electricity prices should be so they're not so, so stable. Among social risks, uh, pandemic risk has the uh, greatest impact, and uh, epidemics and pandemics in the world can also have uh, the opposite positive effect. So this type of risk is characterized by increased control. Um, the outbreak of coronavirus infection in 2020 shows us that pandemic risk can affect renewable energy both positively and negatively. And on the one hand, uh, it prevents the completion of projects, but on the other hand, it stimulates increased investment in renewable energy. 
As for legal risks, legislative changes also play an important role, but they are heavily influenced by political risks that I have presented. The highest technological risks, uh, they are uh, associated uh, normally with limited infrastructure, reduced income due to the intermittency of the renewable sources and the development of energy storage and retention technologies. This can be explained by the fact that technological risks don't depend on external factors, but they depend on technological imperfections. Considering the environmental impact of renewable sources, we cannot claim that the, so they have irreparable environmental consequences but because most of the ecological risks, they have low probability or insignificant financial losses for the society. In addition, risks such as water or air contamination, they are typical also for geothermal energy and hydropower, which excludes uh, other types of renewable energy sources. As for sound and visual noise, many studies demonstrate that this risk is exaggerated by the uh, scientific community. Uh, the impact of noise on health is minimal, and so as technology improves, this risk will be mitigated entirely. And now I will be pleased to present you our visualization map of renewable energy sources. It's based on the personal analysis results where we were considered probability of risk occurrence and consequences. The visualization map allows us to determine that the technological and economic risks have the most influence on the energy strategy and so our normal switch from fossil fuels. And this highlights the importance of reviewing the oil and gas strategic positioning on the market, also taking into account the technological and economic difficulties of such the diversification. And as a result of the investigation, so it's necessary, really important to note that oil and gas companies, they should revise their long-term strategy on the market, given the climate agenda, increasing role of renewable energy sources and their proper uh, economic interests. A new strategic approach that uh, was presented is based on the principles of diversification, which implies numerous potential, potential risks for the oil and gas sector, according to the degree of risk occurrence and the degree of risk consequences for the oil and gas industry. Such visualization map highlights the most promising directions for development and the most urgent challenges. So if you have any questions, I will be glad to answer them and to discuss this topic. Thanks, Ileana. Uh, one probably a quick question just to clarify. Um, have you done like a comparison analysis between the renewable energies and uh, fossil fuels in these particular terms of risk analysis? Or are you supposed to do so? I'm supposed to continue this investigation. So firstly, I was focused on the, um, on comparing the renewable energy risks because so, yes, certainly oil and gas um, industry um, is characterized by other risks. And so maybe by comparing renewable energy sources and fossil fuel sources, we will uh, come to another issues. So just to understand what um, uh, drives uh, oil and gas companies to diversify or no, or just to um, stand by fossil fuel uh, but uh, I think that I'm supposed to continue this investigation so I have started with renewable energy sources as it's very um, it's very actual and urgent topic and um, we have to understand their um, so the essence of renewable uh, renewable energy before getting into uh, diversification strategies of oil and gas companies good thank you very much um, now we will switch now to um, to um, uh, Alina Bokumbu and Diana uh, uh, Abenova, and they would speak a little bit about the sustainability as a new approach. Uh, no, sorry, oh. it's about Angelina Bocumbu. Sorry, I'm so sorry. We are missing the missing the point. So, and let's start and talk a little bit about the eco business. Is it really a trend, or is it a necessity? which is uh, like um, based on the uh, ideas that we need to somehow reduce our environmental and carbon and climate impact. So Angelina, please start. So good evening, dear colleagues. My name is Angelina once again, and today I would like to tell you about the eco business. 
Since I don't have much time, I will try to be brief, but discuss the main aspects of this topic. So here's the plan for today's presentation, but I won't spend time re reading it. So eco business and uh, eco products are not just a passing trend of fashion. The severe reality of modern world has influenced the fact that people themselves have, to, have come to the emergence of such phenomenon as eco business because environmental problems are growing exponentially and this is a concern. And we are responsible for the world in which our children and grandchildren will live. So every human activity from farming to construction and even checking your email affects the environment. Scientists call it ecological footprint and measure it in global hectares. So it's uh, the land needed to provide resources for human activities and absorb their waste. So the more resources a person or society consumes, uh, the larger its ecological footprint. So the period of the COVID-19 pandemic and the quarantine in particular made people think once again about what we have done to the nature and especially the rethinking was influenced by the fact that the fish began to return to the base or that the air became much cleaner. Uh, many of the world's leading brands try to adhere to the ideology of SDG and CSR and many of others. So I'm more than sure that all of you know about it. And one of their components is the idea of environmental friendliness of products. So by creating an eco-friendly eco business, you can bring us closer to a better world where the level and the quality of people's life uh, will be higher. Unfortunately, there is an opinion that eco business is less profitable than a business that doesn't try to adhere to the idea of environmental friendliness. Uh, but however, in our time, this opinion can be confidently called erroneous. So this line of business is fresh, which means that there are many ways to develop and create a new profitable business. And eco-friendly factor makes products more expensive. And there are brands that have made money exclusively on green business. So Russian brands, for example, know about the success of eco-promotion strategies, but not everyone has realized that if you declare yourself as an eco-friendly brand through point of sale communication or your green logo and so on, you do not have the right to remain an empty brand, a brand that is only limited on branding. So you're responsible for your application and your status. And if it works today and your eco-friendly design attracts customers, then sooner or later you will be caught in lie and customers will turn away from you. So any business can be made eco-friendly regardless of the type of activity. And today I want to tell you about new little known but very promising eco-friendly projects. And I'll talk about completely different successful eco-businesses. So first one is Pangaea. It is more than just a trendy Swiss youth brand. So part of the reason uh, that their clothes are so hard to get is because of the direct-to-consumer brand um, that also focuses on sustainability by practicing eco-friendly production methods such as recycling materials and using environmentally friendly dyes and also limiting quantities overall. And now it is offering support to indigenous communities in the Amazon rainforest, many of whom have been impacted by COVID-19 pandemic. So there is a set of hoodies which are rather expensive and they were made with, in collaboration with Costa Brazil. It's another sustainable brand and full 100% of proceeds go towards the Amazon uh, Forever Fort, which helps deliver PPE and medical supplies to the various villages as well as help relocate more doctors to the region. And the, the last but not least thing I, that I would like to tell you about is the Cozia. It is a browser that plants trees uh, while you search the web. So browser uses the profit it makes from searches uh, to plant trees um, where they are needed most. And over 123 million of trees have already been planted all around the world. And so we know that trees mean a happy environment, healthy people and strong economy, and it's extremely important. So, and uh, to make the users trust, um, Ecosia publishes its monthly financial reports on its website. So there is a QR code on this slide and you can scan it and go directly to the Ecosia website if you want. Actually, that's all for today. I hope you liked my presentation and it was useful. If you have any questions, uh, you can ask. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much.
It was a really, really good introduction of what the eco business is all about and how it works. And uh, even about the uh, eco-friendly brands, which is uh, very nice to also see as examples. Now we go on uh, discussing the eco business and mainly in the world of uh, sustainable fashion. So Alina and Diana, are you there? Yes. yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alina Abdulhakov and my colleague is Diana Benova. And today we would like to present our research about sustainability as a new approach for fashion brands promotion. Uh, the chosen topic is vital not only during the pandemic times, but also it will be necessary to prevent the environmental from deteriorating problems of Research is adverse impact of text. Pro our problem of research is adverse impact of textile industry on environment and climate change. And methods that we use in our research is statistics and real cases. Yes, it is scientifically justified that the textile industry produce more carbon emissions than the airline and maritime industries combined and approximately 20% of water pollution of the globe is the result of uh, wastewater from the production and finishing of textiles. Yeah, and the aim of this research is to demonstrate how the trend is gaining momentum and why it can boost brand's awareness and make it even more successful using sustainable marketing sustainably. As you can see on the pie chart, consumers have become more value-driven and purpose-driven because of uh, business ecological impact awareness. And the research shows diversification of customers in the apparel and footwear industry. Uh, 46 percent uh, are value-driven customers and it proves that people are really becoming more conscious about consuming fashion goods. That is why consumers are now focusing on the environmental footprint of their clothing and many are choosing second-hand in order to extend the lifespan of products, reduce unstable new production and divert waste from landfills. However, the second-hand clothing trend also appears to be driven by affordability especially now during COVID-19 economic crisis. So why it is highly recommended field to promote? Uh, the number of sustainability oriented consumers is growing every year. And as you can see from the slide, it is expected that the number of secondhand shops will be increasing because of sustainability as a fashion approach. And what about Russia? Unfortunately, the global trend of sustainable fashion in Russia has not developed yet. Very few think about the global overproduction of clothes. However, there are some great examples that have appeared recently. One of them is Restart Wear brand. Together with celebrities, the brand is not only willing to give clothes a second life, but also support worldwide fund for Nature Russia. Also, there is a trend to search for alternative materials. So in our country, it is the brand named Polaris that uses old ads banners in order to develop shoppers production that can be used instead of plastic bags. Nevertheless, there is an upcoming trend of promoting such businesses uh, on the internet. And we hope that the government uh, support for such small businesses will be developed to do a sustainable business properly. However, not each company lives up to the claims that are made and when sustainability is implemented as a marketing tool. For instance, a well-known H&M. On the one hand, the entire business model of this fashion brand is based on the latest trends and encourages consumption, which is inherently unsustainable. On the other hand, they have a couple items for a specific line that is made sustainably. What does it show? Greenwashing. In contrast, Patagonia is a good example of sustainable marketing message as they actually can encourage people to only buy what you need uh, to buy locally and to repair what you already have. And another good example is Tan Tree. At the, same, at the name suggests, the company plants 10 trees for each item purchased and has a goal of planting 1 billion trees by 2013. The clothing is perfect for active wearer, all made from varying blends of sustainable fabrics. They are aiming to become the most environmentally progressive brand on the planet. 
Another brand is Reformation. Reformation fashion brand also uses ethical and sustainable methods to produce its apparel line. On the brand's website, you can see how many gallons of water or pounds of carbon dioxide waste were saved during the production of each garment. So to sum up, it is significant to highlight that sustainability is not a, a trend anymore. It has become a lifestyle for a large number of people. And that is why companies try to focus on this vital aspect as well, considering the long-term environmental impacts of their business practices and engage people to think of the environmental issues by implementing green marketing campaigns to promote sustainable core values. Hello. Are you through? Yes, actually, we are, we have finished. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, we are welcome. You're welcome. Great. Are you wearing sustainable clothes, or are you are buying from Asian them? Actually, we try not to uh, support such brands and to. Uh, to minimize the number of clothes that we have so actually we are <laughs> we are focusing on sustainable approach yes and as for me on the first year of the Renipa, i began uh, to understand uh, more a sustainable way of life and now i think i'm more conscious about it and uh, as for me i really don't buy clothes if i really uh, don't need it and if it's necessary for example i can modify my old one or repair. As for me, the Patagonia way of sustainable uh, life is close for me. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And Thank it, you. It was like I asked these questions on purpose, of course, just to bridge your presentation to the next one, which is all about reducing personal carbon footprint. And uh, uh, with these presentations, I would welcome Olga Tarasova and Elisabeth Tominaeva. Um, okay. Um, good evening, listeners. Uh, today, we, Olga Taras and Elizaveta Minyaeva, would like to present you uh, our report on minding and reducing our carbon footprint. Uh, it's high time now that we understand the importance of reducing our carbon footprint and start taking measures and launching initiatives to reduce it to the lowest possible level uh, and uh, thus save our planet from global warming. Hello, Lisa. We can't hear you. She's muted. Yes, I'm sorry. My computer is uh, playing fine with me. I'm sorry. Uh, so, a curtain. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, according to the US uh, Energy Information Administration, greenhouse gases are the gases that keep heat uh, in the Earth's atmosphere, and although these gases do occur naturally, uh, still the human activities has contributed a lot in greenhouse gases uh, emissions. Uh, it's uh, very um, important for us uh, to understand that the rise in carbon dioxide level because of human activities and energy consumption um, right, um, has now become the major cause behind overall warming of the globe and overall, overall warming of our planet. Using and wasting electricity, driving vehicles and industrial work are a few common activities due to which the hazardous emissions uh, are the hazardous amount of air gases are emitted. Burning of fuel is dangerous in many ways, uh, as it not only generates carbon dioxide, but uh, it also uh, has several other air pollutants that are really harmful to human health. As per a new study, a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions can be helpful in preventing up to 3 million premature deaths um, by the year 2100. Um, there are three main types of uh, carbon footprint, and the first one is personal carbon footprint. Uh, it is what we leave behind us uh, as a result of moving, consuming, eating, and using resources like energy. Uh, the Nature Conservancy estimates that each inhabitant on the planet produces an average of almost four tons of CO2 uh, every year. Uh, while in countries like the United States, this amount is up to four times. 
uh, under two coalition and the nature conservancy say that we all need to reduce our carbon footprint uh, footprints uh, to less than two tons per year by uh, 2050 and the experts say that this is the best way to ensure the temperatures stop rising and don't reach uh, the dreaded two degrees uh, threshold uh, the second uh, carbon footprint is a carbon footprint of companies. Like human beings, companies also produce greenhouse gases during the activities like manufacturing, transport, and energy consumption. And there are several ways for them to reduce it. Uh, first of all, by consuming energy of 100% renewable region. Uh, secondly, by investing in environmental projects. And finally, by paying green taxes. Uh, consumer goods and services do also emit greenhouse gases before, during, and after their useful life. Therefore, pollution starts with the obtaining of raw materials, processing, production, and distribution through their use and the transformation into waste, which is either reused, recycled, or goes to landfill. Uh, the carbon footprint of events such as concerts, shows, or sports events, among others, is also significant due to aspects like transport, energy, consumption, waste generated, or etc. Uh, now, the main question, how can you individually reduce your carbon footprint? Almost all the sectors of the global economy, like uh, hardware manufacturing or ag agriculture, uh, they are the major contributors of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. It's um, there are necessary measures to reduce this, uh, avoid the worst effects of climate change and evolve away from fossil fuels. It is what we need to do right now from today to save the environment. We are all witnessing the climate change and deep inside we all do know that it is not irreversible. Uh, there are several steps that we can take to save the planet from an ever-changing climate. Here are a few simple yet effective ways that we can be, can be helpful in reducing the carbon footprint. First of all, follow the seven Earth rule, that is refuse, reduce, reuse, rot, recycle, resync, and repurpose. Resync how you view natural resources. Understanding the natural resources that, uh, that natural resources are limited can greatly influence the choices you make in your everyday life. In short, go on zero waste. Um, then uh, less driving and uh, more biking and walking. Uh, vehicle emits the most hazardous air pollutions. Uh, so choose riding a bike. You are choosing a riding a bike. You're also contributing uh, for a better tomorrow by helping the environment and thus reducing your carbon footprint. And uh, minimize the water usage in every possible way. Water is limited, so take uh, shorter showers and uh, it will take you a long way. Uh, minimize your energy usage, uh, choose sustainable and clean energy, and also plant trees by donating just one dollar at teamtrees.org, uh, because trees are vital. As the biggest plants on the planet, they give us oxygen, they store carbon, they stabilize the soil, and they give life to the world's wildlife. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. In, not like in, uh, at, at every conference, I, I managed to you know, listen to the presentations about the, the um, our own carbon footprint. Normally people tend to speak about industries, about companies, about high uh, energy intensive products, but this is kind of a, a good way uh, actually of tackling the, the, the problem by, by you know, um, rewarding it to yourself. What's my contribution to the problem and to the solution? So thank you very much, it was nice. And now, I would like to uh, actually give the floor to Nikola Sekalov to talk a little bit about the role of education, because in the end, you can only handle and manage whatever you know. And if you know, then you kind of armed. And this is to be the, your, the, your contribution to this, uh, to this question. Yeah, thank you very much. You see the presentation, right? Yes. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. My name is Sekolov Nikolai. My topic is uh, how can business education help affect climate change? The plan for this talk is rather simple. I'll start talking about climate change, then cover responsible management, then follow it up with maybe some examples from business schools and outline some lessons to be learned. Let's begin by looking at this graph. It shows us the temperature normal over the past 140 years. Uh, this is the difference between the long term average temperature and the temperature that is actually occurring. It is evident that it has been rising steadily over the last 40 years. 
Even though it fluctuated a little bit, the overall increase is still obvious. This means that the Earth is steadily heating up. Uh, this climate change is mainly caused by greenhouse gases. Uh, they can block the heat from escaping the planet and thus increasing the overall temperature. Uh, the main contributors to this are on the pie chart. You can see that the, one of the top contributors is electricity and heat production, and it's followed closely by agriculture, forestry, and other land use. Oh, well, that's a bit too far, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, and uh, the, we are in danger, obviously, from the climate change. The WHO projects that by 2050, more than 250,000 people will die just from global warming every year. I think that's a huge number. And the question here is obvious. Can we as business educators overcome the seemingly insurmountable hurdles? Well, the key here is teaching responsible management, which will help uh, executives to combat these issues. The UN has outlined six principles for such educations. These are principle one, purpose. It means the students must work on an inclusive and sustainable economy. Principle two is values, the values of global social responsibility, which are incorporated into the curriculum and organizational practices. Principle three is method which tackles the educational materials, processes, environments that enable effective learning experiences. Principle four is research, which helps to understand the role, dynamics, and the impact of corporations in the creation of sustainable social, environmental, and economic value. And principle five is partnership. Uh, it says that business schools must interact with managers to learn more about challenges and um, environmental responsibilities. The last principle is dialogue. It tackles the facilitation and support of dialogue among educators, students, businesses, and stakeholders on critical issues related to sustainability. Obviously, as they are ratified by the UN, these principles are integrated in business schools all over the world. Let's begin with the Norwegian Business School. It shares insight on how it abides by these principles. Their curriculum includes courses on ethical theories and sustainability. They actively engage the students by creating environment and sustainability-oriented cases during case competitions. They also contributed to engaging Oslo in sustainability action when it was named the Green Capital. They organized seminars and conferences to promote ecological concepts. For example, the conference and the importance of bees. They also provided free education to executives during the pandemic. The main appeal of their strategy, in my view, is the methodical approach. They start with the purpose and the aims. Then their values are reviewed and accordingly methods are developed. They also focus on research, seek partners, promote dialogue. Now let's turn to the Harvard Business School. Their curriculum also includes courses on sustainability, but what's more important is their extracurricular activities. They offer various ecology clubs for students. For instance, uh, the Energy and Environmental Club, which is a network for students uh, to learn about clean tech, environment, and other industries. They build a network for students which connects them to the industry professionals. They give them jobs and perhaps some employment opportunities, and they develop the next generation of leaders in the energy industry. The outstanding part about them, in my view, is that the university itself is part of the sustainability agenda. The campuses, they aim to reduce their own carbon footprint and save water and energy. This way, the university shows an example to the students how it can be done. My last example is MIT Sloan. Business school that has embraced sustainability. Its sustainability initiatives aims to provide the best education, apply academic rigor to real world problems. I'm sorry, <laughs> nerves a little bit to real-world problems and empower leaders everywhere to embrace sustainability. This is a joint effort of faculty, alumni, and everybody involved. They have a lot of uh, clubs and initiatives, as I have said. Another of their ventures is MIT Climate Collab. Scientists and students there are lo look for solutions to climate change issues. There are over hundreds of world's leading experts on climate change related fields, and they all work together. Then there is also the S-Lab for Sustained Business. This is a place where students can explore both intersection of business, environment, and society, and then solve real-world cases and gain invaluable experiences. A lot of uh, big companies actually ask for students to help solve their problems. The standout part of sustainability at MIT Sloan is the student involvement, because they involve in different programs, they solve pressing issues, and every student can find something for themselves. Each of the universities offers something that you can adopt. The BI Vision Business School shows the methodical approach. In our action, we also can follow their lead by first setting out our mission and values and then acting accordingly. Then we can uh, engage students through their personal life like they do at Harvard Business School. It actively encourages people to reduce energy uses, to reduce energy uses on campus, thus helping them realize how their actions can be impactful. 
I'm sorry. And then it's uh, the meeting conferences and clubs, like they do at MIT Sloan. These are the places to create ideas, to spread the ecological awareness. And if we make them impactful, if we engage the students, it would be really great. Uh, I think there is still much to learn and much to strive towards, but the first steps are already being made. I hope we can all achieve a more sustainable education in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, basically good examples and, and good approach. Uh, well, you can only expect something from the managers if you start teaching them the right things to do from the very beginning when they are still students. So I like your, your presentations. It, it's really to the point. And now the final one in this succession, we're going to talk about the price to pay. Who is going to pay? Who is going to take costs? Who is going to take risks? What about the inter, um, uh, intergenerational and cross-national bargaining in terms of tackling climate change issues? So I would really thrilled to welcome Igor Makar from the High Schools of Economic with this very sensitive topic. Igor, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, sure you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to uh, make my presentation here. I'm an economist, but today I will speak about climate ethics. Uh, and these two issues, economics and ethics, uh, seem to be very far from each other, but uh, actually they should be interconnected. And uh, I will show you, I'll try to show you in my uh, very short presentation, uh, the examples when these two issues are interconnected and uh, uh, the issues where ethics and ethical issues and ethical choice, uh, they play a very important role in uh, the economic research and in the results of this research. Actually, I will start with the, um, some background. Uh, so the uh, major uh, element of any economic analysis of climate change is cost-benefit analysis. So uh, actually, uh, one compares costs of uh, climate uh, policies, any climate policies, so emission reductions, with the benefits of climate policies. Benefits of climate policies, it is what? It is the preventive damage from climate change. So we, we invest some money to reduce emissions in order to prevent some of the damage that we will have uh, in the future. Uh, and so based on this prevented damage from climate change, uh, the very important um, uh, indicator may be calculated, which is called uh, social cost of carbon. So it is actually damage per unit of CO2. So if uh, CO2 emissions will uh, lead to the damage in the future, so this damage may be uh, divided by the volume of emissions that, uh, that uh, lead to this damage, and we will have the damage per unit of CO2 or a social cost of carbon. And in uh, the ideal world, this social cost of carbon should be equal to the carbon price. So we should uh, pay for carbon now uh, the uh, sum of money which is equal to the social cost of carbon. So it is the background of the uh, whole analysis, economic analysis of climate change issues. But there, where is the ethics here? So everything may be calculated, uh, it seems like that. But uh, actually the ethics is in the equation which is, uh, which is shown in this uh, like uh, last bullet, uh, the problem is that costs occur right now, uh, while most of the damage occurs in the future. So we, when we compare costs and benefits in the issues like climate change, we compare uh, things which uh, happen in different time periods. So, and again, costs, uh, they appear right now. We have costs right now. We should reduce emissions right now, but benefits of climate policies in the form of the preventive damage, most of these benefits will come in the long future. And the most, the major instruments to uh, recomputate this future uh, results, this future benefits from climate policies to the uh, present, to the present value is discounting. So discounting rate, uh, which uh, the equation you you may uh, see here in this slide. So this is exactly the percentage rates that uh, may help us uh, to uh, recomputate the costs of the future, the costs in the future to the present value. So we should divide it by uh, this uh, this thing, one plus uh, this discount rate. 
uh, and it also depends on the time we, we, we look at. And the problem of climate change is that it is a very long term story. So when we analyze, cl uh, analyze climate change, we uh, should make the analysis for decades, for uh, at least for five decades or even for seven, eight decades. And the problem uh, is with this is uh, that this discount rate is very sensitive to time. If you see here, this coefficient, it is T, it is time. If we uh, introduce 50 here, you may see that the result of this uh, whole expression would change dramatically. And this is the table which shows the difference in the results with uh, for, for different uh, um, variants of real discount rate. So if we introduce zero here to here, so the $1 million in the future would be equal to $1 million now. They, they would be equal to each other. But if you introduce 10, 10%, as a discount rate here. So the $100 uh, million dollars in the future in 50 years will, would be equal to just eight, uh, um, $850,000 uh, uh, right now. So uh, you may see that the change of discount rate from zero to, to one or to then to four to seven to 10 would, would lead to the absolutely different um, levels of present value of future costs. And this leads us to the very important conclusion that the choice of discount rate would uh, have a crucial role for uh, estimating the climate damage in the future and thus in decision making about our, our climate policies right now. Uh, and uh, the most important economic debate about all this issue, uh, it uh, was held by uh, two uh, absolutely famous economists, Nicholas Stern, who is a major author of uh, so-called Stern Report, uh, the most comprehensive review on climate change ever, ever made. It was published in 2007. And William Nordhaus, uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, exactly for uh, his climate uh, economic models. And uh, the major debate among them was, uh, uh, was connected exactly to uh, the discount rate they used. So if we take the discount rate, which is more or less equal to the market discount rate, uh, in uh, this interpretation of William and House, it is more or less equal to 2.5%. So it is more or less equal to the discount rate used in the common markets, in the markets of ordinary goods. So then the social cost of carbon would be about 40 euro per ton, uh, 40, 40 dollars, sorry, sorry, per ton of CO2, which is more or less equal to what the European Union has now. Uh, a little bit more, but in general, these this, uh, numbers are maybe compared quite closely. But if we uh, choose the discount rate, which is less than 1%, which was the proposal of Nicholas Stern, then the social cost of carbon would increase by $200 per ton of CO2. So the choice of social cost of carbon would, uh, be, uh, uh, would, would make a crucial role for the results of economic analysis of climate change. What is the right social cost? What is the right discount rate? Is it uh, better to use discount rate 2.5% or it is better to use discount rate with just 1% or even less as Stern proposed. Nobody knows. There is no answer to this question. This is ethical question because the uh, uh, choice of discount rate, which is close to zero, means that we estimate future as important as, to, as the present. If we uh, use the discount rates much more than uh, 1%, like 2.5%, it means that we value our future less than our present. So how much do we value our future compared to our present? This is a question. And this is ethical question, which again uh, makes difference in the results of economic analysis. Moreover, the discount rate is not a single number which may be shared by everyone. The discount rates uh, may differ uh, not only across generations, but they may differ also across uh, people of different ages, 
usually young people who uh, have a longer life ahead of them have usually lower discount rates because for them future is more important than for elder people. Uh, and the elder people, the aged population, they usually have uh, a bit uh, larger uh, discount rate. And this is in the center of the conflict that we uh, may see uh, in the discussion about climate change, for example, in Europe or in the United States, uh, when the young people usually are the most active in uh, requiring uh, the more active climate policies. But aged people who actually make most of decisions, they are just much more passive. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that they have much larger discount rate in their decision making than younger population. This is a question. Moreover, the discount rates they also the discount rates also differ across countries, because uh, usually the most developed countries they have lower discount rate uh, in their decision making because they have already uh, solved most of their current problems and they may think about the future. While at the same time, uh, poorer countries, uh, especially the poorest countries of the world, they usually have the largest discount rates. Uh, just because they have a lot of problems they have to solve right now, for them, present uh, to solve the present problems uh, is much more important usually to, than to solve the long-term problems like climate change. And that is one of the reasons why it is developed countries who uh, are the most active in uh, in uh, promoting climate agenda and in leading climate policies. The problem is that uh, most of emissions, they happen not in the developed countries, but in the emerging economies and in the developing countries. And that is the problem. And this leads us to the other issue of climate ethics. How uh, should the responsibility uh, spread and allocated among countries, how the responsibility for climate change prevention should be allocated among countries, who should be blamed for climate change and who should uh, make most of efforts to mitigate climate change, to cope with climate change. One, uh, I will uh, say just two issues uh, because I have a lack of time right now and so I will, uh, I will um, just very briefly overview them. The first issue is uh, who should pay for, for climate change prevention? Uh, those countries which emit right now or those who are historic emitters, those who, uh, who emitted most of CO2 and other greenhouse gases in the past, in the 20th century, for example. And so here is the map which shows the distribution of historic emissions across countries. It is not very, very different from uh, the map of current emissions, but there are some issues and there are some nuances in some countries. For example, countries like India or African countries, they usually say that you uh, affected uh, our climate. You developed countries like the United States, uh, like the European Union, like Russia as well, and the Soviet Union, I mean. You should be blamed for climate change because your emissions in the 20th century were the major reason why the temperature is rising right now. So you uh, provoked it, you should fix it. And uh, this is another question that should be addressed. And this is also an ethical question. Who should, uh, who, who has the, uh, the largest responsibility for, um, for uh, reducing emissions in the future? And the second ethical question, uh, already in the, again, in the cross country perspective is uh, the question who should pay producers or consumers of carbon intensive goods. And we have uh, the uh, very clear fault line here between the OECD countries, developed countries who are shown in the left uh, table and uh, BRICS countries, which are shown in the right table. You may see in the last two columns of these tables that uh, Developed countries are net consumers of carbon intensive goods. Uh, most of them import a lot of goods, uh, a lot of carbon intensive goods from abroad, from where? From BRICS countries, who are the major exporters of carbon intensive goods. Who should pay for emissions? Who should, uh, who, or should, who should take the most of responsibility for eliminating these emissions? Uh, uh, is, uh, is this the responsibility, first of all, of producers of these goods? 
countries and companies who uh, generate these emissions directly. Or this is the responsibility of consumers who consume these goods, and these goods are the reason, the major reason why these emissions are generated. Probably some mix should be used while, while producers and consumers of carbon intensive goods should share responsibility for that. But again, it is an ethical question. So, uh, and uh, this question has no one single answer, uh, which may be determined by the economic logic or which may be determined by uh, the political logic. It sh it, again, it has an uh, ethical nature, and, but this, uh, ethical choice, it determines the, um, like the concrete uh, decisions that affect uh, climate uh, policies worldwide and that are crucial for reducing emissions worldwide. So this is well, this was my short review of ethical question in, clim in the climate agenda and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. I uh... I do hope that the concepts that you introduced were not really, really very heavy for understanding. Anyway, I think that uh, uh, it's good that we put them on the table for everybody to think about it a little bit and, and to start uh, understanding better uh, the, the complexity of the issue, basically, from both economic point of view and from ethical point of view. Now we have a little bit of time for questions and answers. Anybody willing to start? Hello, no? No. In this case, uh, I would probably ask a few questions. First of all, um, first of all, first of all, uh, about, the, about the education. So we had, uh, in, in, in the presentation of Nikolai, we had quite a few good examples of uh, uh, sustainability as, 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 a, as an approach to education and sustainability as a subject of education in the universities, within the business education uh, uh, school, right? Do we have, or maybe you have any any knowledge about about the same in, in Russia? About the sustainability in Russia? Well, um, I collected some information about uh, our institute, about the IBS. I know that we have a project like Echo IBS, which focuses on an eco brand. They want to create dialogue, uh, teach students about sustainability, show them how it can be done. But this project is still in its infancy and we have to see how it, how it pans out because I think it was started like a week or two weeks ago. So. The steps are there. This kind of, a, uh, this kind of a, like initiative, initiative group, which call themselves Green University. If you, if you Google, you'll probably find. But this is not about this is not more, more about teaching. This is more about being like a sustainable organization rather than uh, rather than really teaching modern sustainability concepts to students. So anyway, but uh, I, I would I would probably suggest that uh, to the extent that you have the chance probably to promote this inside the uni your university. That would be nice to do anyway. Thank you very much. Now, uh, probably another question to, to Igor Makarov. Well, this is, this is really a hard topic to actually discuss. I mean, this discounting stuff, uh, especially when, when we try to like, differentiate discount rates between generations and between uh, geographics. Um, and this like discussion between two like prominent economists, I mean, Nicholas Stern, and uh, William Nordhaus about what, what is the proper one. But do you, do you think that there are in practice kind of a, um, kind of a, a, a compromise that people can come to, like maybe not in the theoretical you know, terms, but practically, how, how they actually they come to conclusions when they, when they discuss climate, climate issues during the international negotiations? Somehow they manage. So is there kind of a model that would describe the way they, they come to, to terms while discussing these issues? Uh, actually, most of the decisions are not made based on the model, but the model somehow, and economics is a uh, science and uh, is academic discipline, which uh, shows us how the decisions are made, even if this, they are not made based on the economic models. 
So economics shows us very well that uh, young people are uh, in most of the countries, actually, and especially in the Western countries where the awareness on climate change is the largest, they are uh, most more worried by climate change uh, than uh, the aged population. And one of the reasons of it, because they have the another uh, this country. So this is uh, one of the examples how this uh, economic concept shows us the, uh, the, uh, the real decision-making problem. My, but, my, question was, yeah. my question was still during the negotiation period, like we're going to have the one in Glasgow coming soon, right? So people will be sitting all together in Glasgow then like hundreds of people all, all at one place discussing different climate issues. Somehow they will come to terms, right? And, and because they manage somehow to come to terms, that actually means that at some point they kind of do agree about, well, well probably not per se, right? But like, like, in the, like in the background, they would come to terms how they would tackle this issue about this, you know, the, 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 uh, the way they, uh, they convert tomorrow benefits into today's costs, how they would compare them. Otherwise, uh, and we have quite a, quite a history already of the quite of successful negotiations, which basically means that despite of the differences between people and different social groups, somehow they manage to come to terms. So what, what, is, the, what is the way, what is the background on which they agree? Yeah, uh, they, of course, Everyone is agree, nearly everyone is agree that climate change is a bad thing, which is dangerous and which will uh, affect, affect our welfare in the future. So it is, it is like a compromise and uh, it is a good base for cooperation anyway. But uh, there is very few of the compromise about the details, as you know, and uh, we see it, we actually see it in the, uh, in the negotiations. And in uh, the uh, Kyoto process, in the Kyoto protocol, within the Kyoto protocol, uh, uh, there was an attempt to uh, solve this difference in the discount rates, in interests, in the priorities of different countries with the help of the principle of common but differentiated responsibility. Uh, but then uh, it became obvious that uh, it does not reflect the reality very well because um, it is exactly countries which are less responsible to uh, cope with climate change developing countries. They emit more and more, more and more, and they become the major emitters. So that's why this principle of common but differentiated responsibility, it was, uh, it was not eliminated. It is still in the, in the documents, but it is not dominant any, any, anymore. But uh, however, uh, it is one of the problems of the Paris process, of the Paris Agreement, is that for countries, it is very difficult to uh, come to general conclusions, except for the general agreement that climate change is bad. That's why the uh, general objective to uh, reduce emissions and uh, the general, uh, general objective to uh, achieve uh, two degree targets or even one point five de half degree, it is a compromise. But the details, the contributions of any particular country, they are very far from compromised. And uh, there is very few agreement in these issues. And one of the reasons is that different countries have different uh, priorities and different countries have different uh, discount rates. So that would be my question, my uh, response. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have the final subsession left. And we're going to talk about like uniting forces or joining forces in tackling climate change. Uh, and, and I would be very much um, in a position to welcome our uh, we Colombian uh, participants with their presentation about, about what uh, armed forces can do in, in this regard and, and how they can be smartly used to deal with uh, sustainability issues and especially climate change issues. So I, I wouldn't actually, I would, First of all, I would ask you to like, uh, say a few words about yourself, to represent yourself, and then it's up to you to select which order is best for you. I'm not going to interfere. So let's make it like a Colombian session for this, for this forum. Hello, guys. Do you hear me? Hello. No. Interesting. Are you there? Gordon, Rue, Sanchez, are you there? 
No. Oops. I guess we somehow came to the end in this regard. If nobody is willing to talk anymore, I don't see them basically. Are they are they are they here? Hey, Mr. Joking. Yes. Okay. Are you here? Yes, Great. Here. Finally. Uh, thank you for the invitation. So please start with a small introduction, right? That would be good. Yes, uh, I will do the, intro the introduction. Thank you, Mr. Joking, for this invitation. Um, good afternoon to most of you there in Russia because well, because here in Colombia we are still in the morning. So my partners and I will develop the, our presentation about how the Colombian Air Force contribute to the implementation of the country SDGs, most know as Sustainable Development Goals, and the practical measures we take to achieve these goals. We are second cadet grades of the Military Aviation Academy School from the Aeronautic Program. I, I am the, the second grade cadet Trujillo Gordon, Julian Edward. Well, the first thing I want to do is to contextualize you about the Colombian Air Force. In Colombia, there are three military forces, Army, Navy, and the Air Force. The acronym uh, in Spanish of Colombian Air Force is FAC. Their mission, our mission, is to defend the sovereignty and Colombian territory and airspace. In this presentation, we will establish how the Colombian Air Force contribute to the development of the nation and the achievement of the sustainable development goals. We focus our presentation in three aspects, re three relevant aspects. The first one is focused on the social approach. Well, what are the social actions carried out by the Colombian Air Force? As you may know, Every military institution is the main objective is to defend the interest of the nation. And the social file is especially important to consolidate that mission. Colombian Air Force with its logistical and operational capacities carry out operations to support communities. Well, the question would be, which are those different operations that FAC does to support society? Well, the answer is first one, difficult rescue and rural and remote areas. Colombia, as you may know, as you may know, or you don't probably, Colombia is a country with a remarkable diverse geography. Well, we have mountains, jungles, uh, deserts, and even in rivers and even deserts. And that's why it is necessary to perform rescue and medical transportation operation in order to help people in emergencies. Uh, the most useful uh, aircraft for these kind of operations are Black Hawk, Cessna Caravan, and King 350. Uh, the um, sustainable development goals we, we try to achieve with these kind of actions is number three, good and health, well-being, and number 11, sustainable cities and communities. Well, another action which we do is humanitarian aid, the transport of the humanitarian aid. We support the distribution of humanitarian aid in coordination with another government uh, agencies in order to, to transport this, uh, this aid to the person who really need it. We purpose, our, uh, the purpose objective for these actions is no poverty, cleaning water and sanitization, and the sustainable cities and communities. The next one will be the last one, forest fire extinguishing. As you may know, Colombia is a tropical, is a tropical country. So the tropical countries are most able to have uh, those uh, disasters, that kind of disasters uh, because of the climate change. Climate changes specifically affect our country and that produce large scale forest fires. So uh, the purpose objective for these actions are, uh, are sustainable cities and communities, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions. Well, the main point of this 
is to establish how all of the actions that social that Colombian Air Force do in favor of social of society had a positive impact on the social and the economic development in order to achieve the SDGs. So I am going to talk about the environmental protection. I'm going to say like the context. So uh, the role of the military forces in the protection and defense of the environment in Colombia. The relationship of the environmental issues with the defense sector arises with law 99 of 1993. This law gives life to the environmental system and the Ministry of the Environment and also established. It is Article 103 that the military forces have as part of its function the protection of renewable and no renewable natural resource, developing function and actions of control and surveillance in support on environmental authorities, territorial entities, and the community. Then I'm going to talk about the SDG in Colombia. I'm going to take like a little points of this. That is the geopolitics in the 21st century will be merged in the aspect and sustainable or sustainable development within a publicity with the environment. Sustainable or sustainable development at the basis of the development and new generation. It has a commitment on only the country's population, but also to the world, to the population. It is important to articulate the objects and goals of public and private institution to achieve sustained economic political, social, and environmental development. Therefore, a responsible country is country reorganized and integrated into an international community. We have some pictures right here that shows some, some things about the SDG in Colombia. The green arrows indicate an advance compared to previously decade. The yellow ones, the full men, have some of the goals. The orange one and as a nation and the, one, and the red ones as it back. The SDG in Colombia 6, 7 and 13 present progress compared to previous decade. It is expected trajectory. The objective is in the progress of being fulfilled. The SDG 14 shows compliance with some of the goals. Modern programs, the objective have level of programs at a rate higher than uh, 50%. And the SDG 30, uh, 15 uh, shows like a life of territory ec ecosystem that has a uh, sit back. Then the also layer protection is about the environmental degradation and force assume the task of protection. This is talking into account to the great that the environmental degradation caused by multiple factors such as the greenhouse effect. The whole in the ozone layer, deforestation, water and land pollution, acid rain, and consumerism, among others. The military forces have assumed the task of contributing to protect nature and all the peace in, in the nation. The Colombian military forces have undertaken tasks such as the deforestation, the use of renewable energy sources, measures against pollution, demographic control the awareness of the population and the economic um, in the use of resources, especially those of energy and water. Taking this in account, uh, we have a measure taken and planned that Colombia Air Force social responsibility model in harmony with its strategic and management model. The Colombian Air Force has a RS model based on its value offer that destructive capabilities and aid articulate access to create economical, social, and environment value. Within the environment practice of Colombian Air Force are the existence in the air units and training schools of an environmental management plan that is updated every year for environmental awareness and education to members of the institution in our community. Taking this in account, we have the results about this plan and carried out action. That is, obtaining a certification 
with which all air bases were accredited through an environmental management system. Currently, the Convert Air Commons have a wastewater treatment system that is all the base that we have. It is important challenge to prevent damage that may be that may be irresistible for inhabitants of the unit. It has to do the liquid that is used for the human consumption and well as for aeronautical manufacturing and maintenance. It is expected to, that we can we reforest more than 65,000 hectares with native species such so as African palm, Caribbean palm, rubber, um, a tree of century, um, a lot of, of tree that we have right here in Colombia that produce oil. And all of this in order to recover the ozone layer to restore oxygen to it reaching our country. All right, thank you. Well, um, I'm going to talk about the. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about the innovation component and I'm the second year uh, cadet in Lombana Sanchez William Santiago. We will present below the innovation component with the Colombian Air Force development, uh, research and innovation are uh, fundamental pillars uh, to the defense of the sovereignty of the Colombian territory uh, to be able to comply with the SDGs and uh, postulated by the United Nations organization. Okay, for this issue, a main problem uh, has been raised, uh, which is uh, how should uh, be the management that states uh, give to the use of new technologies? Well, um, this problem uh, is answered with four components uh, in the Colombian Air Force. The aeronautical maintenance uh, in order to comply with the SDGs um, are uh, so important because uh, are uh, saving, protecting, and efficiently using the resources uh, in our aircraft. As materialistic uh, facts uh, about this, uh, we have the measures uh, implemented with the Colombian aeronautical regulations and the efficient use of the fuels. Uh, well, this complies with the SDGs related to the climate sector and the terrestrial life, uh, which includes the protection of the uh, nature and the animals. To continue to the topic, uh, we have the contribution uh, that the Colombian Air Force gives to the development of the country. It's a place air in the space and the cyberspace uh, to contribute to the consolidation and the development of the territory and the population through onic feed actions. As materialized uh, facts on this issue, the Air Force has worked on the strategic military alliances, the exchange of uh, goods, knowledge and technologies and the security and defense practice in a sustain and sustainable way. With this, we managed to comply with the SDGs related to uh, sustainable communities and the ability to maintain peace and justice in the Colombian people and their communities to, uh, is important to achieve the, the proposed objectives. Then we have the optimization of the air bases uh, to our uh, all of the technological components as an innovative force, uh, we see uh, the constant growth uh, for our air bases, as well as uh, uh, we have the developed sophisticated technologies and equipment uh, for operational areas such as the flight simulator or optimization, the creation of the aerospace medicine center, and the development of the research of the innovation centers. Well, um, as the last point, uh, last point and uh, most important for the Colombian Air Force in its guided vision uh, to the year 2042 uh, is the space contribution. The Colombian Air Force uh, take advantage of uh, that uh, in the space environment in search of the protection nature and the resource of the environment, taking actions uh, to provide uh, support to environmental authorities. Uh, the most outstanding uh, of the Air Force is in regard at the development of the satellite program, such as the FACSAT-1 or the FACSAT-2, and uh, the contribution to the rocketry, uh, to the meteorological phenomena, and the contact uh, security service, and uh, all of the, to the Colombian people and their communities. 
These technological components uh, contribute for the fulfillment of the SDGs related to the maintenance of the peace and the uh, life. And uh, all these uh, strategic islands uh, are in search of maintaining peace and justice. Okay, and uh, finally, uh, all these actions that uh, we have exposed are postulated in the document of the Institutional Strategic Mission of the Colombian Air Force. Uh, which is guided to the final file until the year 2042. Um, and well, uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention, for allowing the Military Aviation School to participate in this event. Well done, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, let me ask the, the Russian part of the audience. Maybe you have some questions for the Colombian participants. Huh? It would be nice if you have some. No? Let me then ask a few questions to you guys, please. Okay? The, the, okay, first, the first question. Okay, the first question would be uh, okay, basically the 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 main purpose of the main task probably of the um, uh, like military aviation is actually to to safeguard the borders, right? To 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 defend the the country from the external uh, uh, enemies, right? But at the same time, you were talking a little, quite a lot about the uh, enemy, which is which is the climate change and which is environmental issue. So how you would combine this? What, what, is the, what is the mix between these two tasks that you actually have to serve? Uh, like well, um we think the we have two enemies the biggest enemy we have all in the world is the climate change of course and as i said in my in my uh, presentation uh, colombia is a country with that always is have is uh, facing problems uh, related to the climate change so for us for us to another uh, another function or the main purpose of the colombian air force is is even to uh, take measures and devel uh, develop um, an environmental strategy in order to in order to protect our country, to protect the people who live uh, in our country, the, the our communities, the, our society. All right. No escucho más. All right. And then you're going to be talking about the innovations. Uh, and uh, you mentioned what are sophisticated technologies that are uh, kind of using to to actually um, uh, keep up with your with your tasks and with your goals, um, it, does it mean that actually there's like two two like two target technologies that are basically can serve the military um, goals and basically the environmental protection or people protection uh, goals as well, right? They are not purely military, so they're kind of yeah, can you, civil uh, and military, right? The question? The, the question was the uh, the relation between the innovation technologies that you are using. Are they not 100% military? So I, I, I have an idea, I have an impression that they are half at least civil rather than military, right? Yeah. So they can be used for both things at once. Yeah, for example, we use for a uh, we use our satellite in order to for example the, our satellite it take photos of the Colombian geography in order to know where are happening a disaster and where we need that help so one of the use of this innovation uh, uh, invent is to is focus on that okay I understand uh, any other questions from the Russian side, guys? No, no more. All right, thank you very much for your very nice presentation. It was good to get to know you. <laughs> thank you for your time. Thank you for your efforts. It, it was really good. Thank you. Do, maybe you have some questions to the Russian participants. Um. Thank you so much, Mr. Jolkin. I really appreciate your uh, the invitation of this kind of um, activities because we like to much have um, that change of cultures. 
is really important for us. Okay, I'm going to uh, say. Yeah, like, just basically uh, that. Thank yeah. you for all. Yeah, sorry. Because it's like a time that is really important for us that we can spend and learn a lot of much things about all the things around the world. And it is important for us. So thank you very much. And uh, well, thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Thanks, and uh, well, uh, our purpose is uh, complete with the SDGs, and uh, uh, we are very grateful uh, for uh, participating in, in this event. Thank you very much. It's, it's basically what is, what is, but it's like a model to follow, I guess, because when we bring the young people from all over the globe with one table, discuss the most urgent, the most, like, you know, serious issues that we are facing it's good for the for all of us and if you have kind of contribution from the like elder people with kind of knowledge with uh, with the um, responsibility then basically it, it even it even you know make make the whole uh, adventure uh, more solid i would say right so thank you very much yes. once again for your participation I, I really look forward that we will continue this way uh, maybe next year Right. Yes, thank you very much. So thank you for everybody. We are kind of in time, which is kind of a miracle. Uh, but uh, I, I really would like to thank you all for being very uh, precise, for being well to the point, for all your efforts, for all your attitude towards the issue. And uh, have a good night. Bye bye.